I've got the Snapchat glasses, so I really want to get a little shot. When I say go, can you give me the applause again, please? Ready? <laughs> go. <laughs> I'm not going to keep them on through the whole talk. Um, yeah, so I'm a creative technologist now, uh, but I was a, a front-end developer for... Oh God, too many years, uh, 12, 13 years. I've been making my living on the web uh, for 17 years now. In fact, I'm actually here as part of the diversity program to get more old people speaking. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was Netscape 4 and IE5 was the environment when I started developing. Um, but I really want to start looking at the future. At what's, and it, I've got kind of quite a lot of questions, really, and not many answers, so forgive me for that. This is really rattly as well. Seb was talking about this yesterday. It's quite distracting. Um, it's like having a pair... It's like I feel like I'm going to roll Yahtzee or something. Um, there's five sections to my talk, um, and I'm not trying to make predictions. I don't like to make predictions. I like to look at trends and s try and find little threads and see where things are going. Um, I'm going to start with this one. Goodbye, browser. Um, Kenneth Alkenberg, who works for Microsoft, I think he's one of the edge um, evangelists or developers, said, we are the last generation to know what a browser is. I think, that's, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think that's genuinely the truth. Um, as an Android user, how many Android users here generally? Slightly over half. As an Android user, you know that if you enter a search query or tap on a link or enter a URL into the, into the Google search bar on Android now, um, what you get is not Chrome. You get this thing with this blue bar across the top. There's no URL bar. And you don't really realize, but you're not actually in Chrome because you have the option to open it in Chrome. You're in something that's powered by Chrome. This is what they call a custom tab. Um, it, they have kind of the same thing on iOS. They call it a view controller. But essentially, although it's being rendered by the web rendering engine, it's not actually the browser per se. Um, and I think Android specifically there's a real big blur between what's part of the web and what's part of the OS now. Um, it started with material design, I think. Material design was kind of to harmonize. started with Android. They're pushing it out to all their web properties. And it kind of means that whether you're using a web page or whether you're using a native app, they kind of look and feel the same. There's a consistency of behavior to them. Uh, it's gone even further with progressive web apps. Um, I, I have two Twitter accounts, because I keep one for myself and one for like a, a local community I work for. Um, and so I have Twitter twice on my phone. But I have one on, which is, uh, one, one is run from uh, the, Twitter mob, the Twitter PWA, and one is the Twitter native app. Um, both of them are shown here. Um, what's interesting is not that they're exactly the same, because they're not exactly the same. There are slight differences. But what's interesting is you don't know which one's which, unless I tell you or unless you know. With the next versions of Chrome, we've got what are called deeply integrated PWAs, where when you, add, when you choose Add to Home Screen, it actually wraps the app inside uh, an APK and installs it to your device. Um, so as well as getting the, the desktop icon, and as well as appearing in the recent apps, you actually get something in your app drawer down here. It's become part of the OS, although when it launches from the desktop icon, what you're seeing is essentially rendered in Chrome, but there's no URL bar. It's on the web. It's rendered in Chrome, but there's no URL, but it's not in the browser as such anymore. You basically can't tell the difference between them. And we see this even deeper on Chrome OS, I think, which Chrome OS was famously, oh, let's make the web the operating system, and has now started bringing Android. It now runs Android and the web side by side. Um, and you can't, again, always tell the difference. What's the web? Because of material design, you don't know which one's which. There's a distinct and definite blurring between the two. Um, and it's not just content that this applies to. It's the technology as well. Um, Dan Callahan said this thing recently, that the wall between native and the web is falling, and developers will be able to seamlessly use the same libraries in both contexts. You've seen that kind of with React and React Native. But what he's talking about here is WebAssembly. Anybody here familiar with WebAssembly? A few people. Uh, WebAssembly essentially compiles C into JavaScript. So you can write an app in C or C++, then you compile it, and it runs in the web in, in JavaScript inside the browser. But you, so you get kind of native 
uh, all the benefits of kind of native speed, but running in a JavaScript virtual machine, essentially. Uh, right now, it works with C, as I said, but in the future, you'll be able to use it with languages like Java, Swift, C Sharp, essentially mobile OS languages. You'll be able to compile into JavaScript, run them in the browser, and that line is blurred even further. Um, also, there's Electron. Electron is web technologies run on the desktop. So the Slack app uh, on the right here is rendered with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the one on the left is rendered with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The difference between them is one has a URL, and one is running locally on your desktop. But what's the difference, then? What's, the, what's the essentially the difference if they're being rendered with the same technology, and they do exactly the same job, have identical functionality? What's the difference? Is the difference the URL? Is that the web? Can we just boil it down to the URL? Uh, Quick quiz, what's the most popular mobile browser? Somebody shout out for me. Opera Mini. Opera Mini? Facebook. It's Facebook. Facebook is the most popular mobile browser. On iOS, almost half, and that's the say, almost half of uh, mobile traffic goes through Facebook. A uh, Facebook web view. And that's identical to all of the other browsers on iOS. On Android, it's slightly lower. It's about a third. But the Android browser landscape is much more diverse. So I think there's a strong case to be made for Facebook being the biggest mobile browser. And we don't really think of it as a browser. But if people are visiting links in an engine that's rendered inside the Facebook app, well, doesn't that make it a browser? In a way, Facebook has made the browser wars irrelevant by becoming the browser itself. Um, and so to Facebook have started to introduce their own rendering format for the web now as well. Instant articles you may have heard of. Um, it's they, the Facebook claimed that it takes an average of eight seconds for a mobile web page to load, which was the slowest content of any content that got shared on their platform. So they created instant articles, which takes the content of websites and renders them in Facebook's own React like or Facebook's own React language and displays them natively inside the app. Um, Google have been doing the same with accelerated mobile pages, AMP, uh, web content, but not rendered using HTML or open standards. Um, Jeremy, I know, spoke, has, got, has written some fantastic articles about this, some very salient criticism of this. Um, I'm not here to kind of address the pros and cons of it, just to say that it exists. Um, Apple News are doing the same. They're rendering what was published web content in their own native format. Um, Baidu in Asia have started doing the same with what they call mobile instant pages. And um, some of the biggest new US news websites, that's CNN, Washington Post, etc., publish up to 60% of their stories to non-native web formats today. Um, when they redesigned The Verge recently, Nile Patel said, the Verge's brand has to connect with audiences that may actually never see it on the open web at all. He said that so much of their traffic comes from Google, and Google is starting to render things in AMP, and the rest comes from Facebook, and Facebook do it in instant articles. He said a lot of their traffic, way loads of their traffic, big chunk of it, is not rendered using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or is rendered using AMP, which is a kind of a hybrid weird subset of it. Um, their visits in September 2016, when he wrote this, 15% of those of their whole web traffic was, um, was using AMP, was through AMP pages. Um, Jeremy, again, talked yesterday about software kind of dissolving into everything around us. And now we're seeing the web dissolving into all the technology, dissolving into all the things and becoming different manifestations of it everywhere. So the interface on demand is my second part. What does this mean? It means the app only appears in a particular context when necessary and in the format most convenient for the user. The website or the web browser is just one manifestation. Um, one of the most popular manifestations of the web probably is uh, notifications. People get, uh, most people get more than five notifications a day. 15% um, of people get more than 20 notifications a day. Um, and if you see here, again, I've got three notifications here, one from Facebook, one from Twitter, one from Chrome. The Chrome is actually from Facebook as well. I use the Chrome web app, and I use the Chrome native app, because I'm one of those 
people who doesn't care about getting too many notifications. Um, but to me, there's essentially no difference. If the web pushes me a notification or if a native app pushes me a notification, what's the difference? If I can see the con all I need to know is that it's his birthday. That's fine. I can swipe that, and I don't care who delivers it to me. Um, but now with notifications becoming richer, especially again in Android, but you know in iOS you can do this as well, share, delete, like, you can take actions on content that affect a website or affect an app without ever going to visit it. So if I sign up, if I go to a website and allow it to send me push notifications, and then they rendered natively, is that still the web? Because I went there initially, does it matter? Um, what about if I get sent a notification and I say, take an action on it, and that updates a website on my behalf that triggers an action on the web? Is that still the web? What's the difference? Where's the line? We don't know. There's kind of this blurring between the two. I could go to a website once, sign up for notifications, and then spend five years interacting with it without ever going back to that website again. Um, and people love messaging. So Messenger, Facebook Messenger, and WhatsApp um, every day send or receive, sorry, send uh, three times as many messages as SMS does globally. Um, WhatsApp in particular has 1.2 billion active users every month. To put that in some kind of context, there are 3.6 billion connected people online in the world today. So that's one third of people use WhatsApp every single month. Um, and Facebook Messenger have recently rolled out their, their Messenger platform. And one of the things they allow you to do is to push uh, web content into this as a web view. So again, if it's being delivered in Messenger and it pops up and I just need it just for that moment, all I need to, might need to do is just choose a size, something that's a little bit, you say I'm shopping, I want to choose a size. It's too much UI for a bot, so it pops open a page. I can take that interaction and down it goes. I just need it for that moment. I just need the web bit for that moment. That's all it does, and then it's gone. It's becoming really popular. Um, and there's a thing now called Wobbles, which is possibly the most unpleasant portmanteau term I've ever heard. This has been rolled out by a messaging app called Kick. Kick, not huge globally, but among American teens, absolutely massive. Um, and they allow you to drop in little bubbles of web content in line in your message. So you can just grab something from a website, or the, 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 the platform can choose to send out these things. At the moment, they're static. There's no reason they couldn't be updated. You could send somebody a little live train update thing through the web, and it just updates every few minutes so people can see where you're going. Um, and you could attach to this your brand. You could attach your analytics. You could get revenue from it. It could be sent out and shared all the way around the web. It's a little bit of content from your site, from your brand. Um, and people might never go to your website, but they're still interacting with your website. Um, and WeChat have recently rolled out a step further. They've unveiled these things called mini programs. Mini programs are essentially chunks of functionality. They're rendered in a, a they have, uh, WeChat have their own language for this. It's, it's very similar to React again and renders natively. Um, and it's discovered by QR codes. So you go into a store, you see a QR code, you open your WeChat app, you snap it, and it opens, say, something that tells you, that plays you the Star Wars trailer or something that renders your cat to look like an impressionist painting. Um, whatever these things are, you do, it does one job and then it goes away. The little online shortcuts uh, dropped all over the physical world. Uh, Connie Chan, who's, written, who's really smart on the subject of, of WeChat in particular, says, think of this as a better version of the browser, where you're already signed in because it's just from one app. Only one app does this. You're already signed in and payment enabled for every site you visit. Say, for example, you scan a, a QR code on your toothbrush opens a page, you hit the button to renew, it closes again. You've just ordered some things from the web or from their app uh, without any kind of friction to it at all. This notion of sort of bringing it into the physical world, I think, is really smart. Um, you can't have failed to notice that voice UI is, is the, the, this year's big thing. Everybody's talking about it, from the Echo family to, um, to Google Home, which launches here next week. Um, I'm talking specifically voice first. We have voice enabled devices, have done for a few years, but voice first or voice only devices are, are predicted to grow massively this year. 
um, from about half a million devices in 2014 to predicted 32 million devices by the end of this year. Um, and remember that these are devices in your home, so this is not one-to-one. -one. These are reaching families or groups of people, so the potential reach of them is much, much bigger. Um, the analysts Gartner predict that by 2020, 30% of web browsing sessions will be done without a screen. One of the things that voice is really good for is enabling the Internet of Things, the smart home. Um, if I have lights and a net thermostat and things from different providers, I don't have to open up multiple different apps. I can just command them through, all through a unified interface. Um, and the web's getting in on that game, too, with web Bluetooth. I think that's really interesting. Um, you connect to the things around you through a website. You become, the web becomes capable of controlling physical devices and things around us in our environment. Um, and a step further, we've got initiatives like uh, FlyWeb by Mozilla that would turn all of the devices around us into a peer-to-peer -peer web so they could talk to each other and send data and be interactive without actually requiring any, any live network connection. Um, the Internet of Things is also good for transmitting Bluetooth through so beacons or Google's near, Android's nearby, as this one is, um, kind of shows you the things around you. They broadcast a URL or they broadcast a download link or they broadcast something. It's app discovery or website discovery, doesn't really matter which one, um, without having to copy links and send them around, do all the hard work. Um, where's, uh, where's JC Chong? Over there. Uh, if, you turn, if you've got an Android phone, a recent one, you should see JC's Twitter handle pop up as she's become broadcast and discoverable around us at the same time. I think, I think Phil Nash has also done the same thing. I've seen his name pop up in my phone a couple of times as well. Uh, it's great for broadcast and it's great for distribution. Um, but I want to go back to the thing about, earlier about QR codes, this idea that nobody uses QR codes. I think QR codes are great. They've just been used really, really badly because no phone has a built-in QR code reader. Um, but the big messaging platforms do. Uh, Snapchat, even Twitter now do, Facebook Messenger. They all have built-in um, uh, QR codes and QR code scanners because it's much, much easier to show somebody a QR code, they scan it, and you're added to them than it is to tell them to search for your name or you send them a link. It just becomes incredibly smooth and frictionless. And I think we're going to see them a lot more. So as I said, Twitter have recently started rolling out their own QR codes. And even the latest version of Chrome on iOS now has a built-in QR code reader as well. Uh, QR codes are everywhere in public spaces in China as pixelated portals to the digital world and as identity verification. Um, they're not used just for links to websites. They're used to, as a proof of, uh, to show someone who you are, to, uh, to that, make that easy connection, um, but also to, um, for example, make it frictionless to join a Wi-Fi. If you go to a restaurant, there's quite a lot of QR codes there, and you just scan that, and you've joined their Wi-Fi. And they know a little bit about you in return. Um, so in China, as I said, they're huge. Even the government's using them for, to promote China to tourists to get around. Um, and I think they're kind of due for a bit of a comeback here. But it's this idea of making the web part of the physical world, of manifesting it in different places. That's kind of the point I'm trying to reach with this. Um, and it also leads me into the next part, which is about kind of the camera. The camera is not just a camera. It doesn't just take photos, not anymore. Um, when Snap went for their recent IPO, one of the things that was prominent in their, uh, in their filing was that they believed that the camera screen Sorry, I'll give you the full quote. They said, in the way that the flashing cursor was the starting point for most products on desktop computers, we believe that the camera screen will be the starting point for most products on smartphones. This is because images created by smartphone cameras contain more context and richer information than other forms of input, like text entered on a keyboard. With computer vision now, images are not just arrays of pixels. They have meaning in them. We can understand them. We know what's in them. We know that this is at sea, that the dog is surfing. Um, there's foam because there's a wave there. The dog's standing on a surfboard, and he's lifting his right paw, his front right paw. We can understand all that stuff now. Um, Rosie's going to talk about deep learning and neural nets in the next session uh, after lunch, which I'm really looking forward to. But it's something that's kind of it's become a commodity. We can just pay for this stuff from Google or from Amazon or whoever and start getting information. And the camera becomes an input device. We can point it at things and understand them and trigger actions based on those. We're going from computers with cameras that take photos 
to computers with eyes that can see. Um, which is why Apple's kind of refusal to put live camera input with get user media in Safari is so galling to me. I find it really unthinkable that there's this whole array of information out there waiting and we can't access it easily through the browser in iOS. Um, Understanding the scene around you, understanding the objects around you in your physical environment is also important for augmented reality, or mixed reality, as people want to call it. This is, this is in my opinion, the next, and not just my opinion, a lot of other people, I think, um, the next major paradigm in computing is augmented or mixed reality. We need to consider the role of the web in this. What is it? Is it literally a thing that you just slap up on a wall in a window like this? I really, really hope not. I really hope there's something more, more creative that we can start thinking about the idea of a web beyond the simple browser as something that exists outside of it that's more conceptual. Um, in the context of AR, equating the browser to the web is not only inaccurate but limiting. For most cases, the, the, the kind of the, the, the blurred thinking that we have of the web is the browser is is is, is fine. Um, but it's not a rep the browser is a representation of the web. The web should be about more than that. But we need to think about it, consider it, that work out what that role is and how it functions. Um, because when AI hits tipping point, it means the internet merges with reality, which is kind of a scary uh, uh, consideration. Um, and then step beyond that, there's VR as well. Uh, people, some people have got their doubts on VR, but you know the, it is here. There is, it is around us. The technology exists, um, and we need to consider what's the role of the web in VR. With things like Web VR and um, A-Frame, which is a declarative markup library for creating VR, the web becomes the very environment around you, and you can share those environments. You can share experience. It becomes like a web of sharing experiences um, with other people. Now, Xiaomi is going to talk much more about this. Again, it's another session I'm really looking forward to. But I think it's something we need to start considering, life beyond the browser, or when the browser becomes the reality around you. So just to kind of take a pause and back up for a second, what I'm, what I'm trying to get to, and hopefully I'm driving across to you, is that for more and more people, uh, the browser is not the primary way they access the web. And I, I think that's genuinely a good thing. I think thinking of the web um, beyond the browser would be something that we need to start doing. Because while mobile has changed the way we communicate with each other, um, the mobile browser is actually kind of preventing the web from changing too. Um, and like, uh, like Dries, I don't define the web as websites alone. I think of the web as kind of a user experience, a shareable user experience that's delivered across multiple channels and devices. Or as Paul Kinlan put it more succinctly, what if everything was the web, but you never saw a browser? Um, so this is kind of a very, very rough generalization of where we are. There's the web, and it has to go to and it pushes out to AMP and instant articles and Apple News. It might be in messaging, could be in your PWAs. Um, you've got your web views. What does it mean in AR and VR? What does it mean for voice UI, mini programs? All of these different things, all of these new things around us that are involved in sharing technology, delivering experiences. The web could sit at the center of that and be the thing that pushes out to all of them. But it needs careful consideration. And then maybe, just maybe, we also kind of think about the browser as well. The desktop browser is not going away in the near future. Um, although, again, I think with things like Electron, it will just merge into the OS as well. And so it kind of, I, I think it matters. I think it matters that we think about this stuff. I think it's really important. Um, David Herman said, and I agree 100%, the main reason I care about the web is because it's the world's biggest software platform that isn't owned. That's really important the most complex machine man has ever created. And there's so much of it that isn't owned. It's distributed. We can all still take part. We can all be part of it. And the full quote that I didn't say earlier from JP Le Breton is, when AI hits tipping point, it'll be nothing less than the internet merging with reality. 
it's imperative that open platforms win that space. AR and VR mean essentially that every single thing you do is tracked. Everything. Where you look, what you say, where you're going. It's the world's biggest tracking machine. If we just leave that in the hands of a few small people, some groups of people, that clustered power, I think that's going to be very, very detrimental to all of us. Um, the picture I showed at the beginning of this ceremony, uh, at the beginning of this section here, this is from um, February last year. For, sorry, February this year. This is from Bucharest. These are the Romanian protests against government corruption. And just that huge glow you can see all the way across it is smartphones. Smartphones and you know the, the internet, connected technology, is just the water we swim in now. It's all around us. It's our environment. It's our ambient. Um, Mina's talk earlier, this morning, showed us what's at stake. You know, the, the political stakes, and they're so involved in driving what people do, the decisions they make that affect us all. Um, this, I love this quote. This is from a, a, a photo essay from uh, some refugees, the refugees who made a very, very difficult crossing to try to get to Europe. And this guy says, this phone was more important to me than my soul. That's the stakes that we're playing with here. That's the stakes with technology now. The web is 28 years old, um, and it's becoming integrated into the fabric of the devices that we depend upon. Um, this is the one-touch ping, which is an insulin pump, which was hacked last year. That's a potentially lethal weapon because it wasn't secured properly. It's connected, but it wasn't secured properly. It was not, you know, if perhaps if this had been open source, if the technology behind it had been open source, people would have been able to check it and know what was going on in there. It wasn't. It was a black box. And um, Bruce Schneier, I'm going to read a, a lengthy quote from him now. He says, we're at the point where we need to start making more ethical and political decisions about how these things work. When it didn't matter, when it was just Facebook and Twitter and GeoCities and fun and games, it was OK that people had like, the special right to, to code the world as they see fit. But now it's the world of dangerous things. Now it's the world of cars and planes and medical devices and everything else. So you know, maybe we can't do that anymore. Maybe we have to start being a bit more serious about what we want to do. The US government are working very or have just repealed ISP protection. For, so they can sell what you do online to interested parties. The UK have said publicly that they want to end you know, end to end encryption, things like WhatsApp. There's a, there's a fight on to because this thing is so powerful and because it powers everything we do. The web becomes part of the things around us, and the things around us take on the power of life and death. So it's critical in this point that we don't lose control of this complex machine that we've built. So I think we need to really consider carefully the role of the web in the future. And I think possibly the first step in doing that is admitting to the end of the browser. Thanks very much. Um, please come and talk to me about this, because I do want, your, uh, do want to hear your feedback. This is the first version of this talk. I really, really want to know what's important to you, what you think is right or wrong. So please come and find me. I'm around all day. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.